Ephesians 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Let's pray tonight. Lord, tonight as we come to the study of your word, I pray, Lord, that you by your spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth, that you would illuminate your word, that your word would renew our mind, that it would strengthen us in the inward man. God, that we would just be given an understanding. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would change us by the power of the word of God. Change us, change how we think, change how we live, God. Make us more like Jesus that we may be the light to the world that you've called us to be. Lord, I praise you tonight. Anoint me, anoint your people, and bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight we continue our look at this great book, and we are continuing to consider how we as God's people are to live our lives. How in light of what we have experienced with so great of salvation, that we have been forgiven of our sin, we have been redeemed, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We've experienced this salvation, and in light of that, how are you and I to live? How are we to live our life? Hey, Michelle, I'm not sure if he got left in here on purpose. How we, as God's people, are to live our lives in light of what we have experienced. And tonight we're going to see once again one of Paul's favorite words that he uses. In fact, it's a New Testament word that's not only used by the Apostle Paul, but it's used by John, it's used by other New Testament writers, but he uses this word, walk. How are we to walk? In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should live it out. We saw in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 1 where he says that we are to walk, walk worthy of our calling, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called. In verse 17 of chapter 4 he says that we are no longer to walk as the rest of the Gentiles. We are no longer to live our life, to walk as the rest of the Gentiles who do not know God. In Ephesians 5 and verse 2, he says, he tells us to walk in love. Walk in love. That's to live that out. In verse 8, he tells us that we are to walk as children of light. That we are to walk as children of light. And then he says in verse 15 that we are to walk circumspectly. That we are to walk in wisdom. We are to now walk out. We are to live out the grace of God that we have received. We considered last week how we are to put away certain things that are associated with the old self. We're to put on new behaviors that reflect what we have experienced in the new birth. We are to cast away certain behaviors. We considered this in detail, and here's what it says in verse 25. 
chapter 4. Here's what it says. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. We put away lying. We speak truth. He tells us there to, to be angry and not to sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And then he says not to give place to the devil. Do not let the devil have an opportunity in your life. Do not let him have a foothold with this unresolved anger. And then he says in verse 28, Let him who stole steal no longer, that we're no longer to be thieves as Christian people. We're to cast that type of behavior off. We're, we're not to steal steal anymore. He tells us there that we're to labor and work with our own hands. And then he says, let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. Let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer, that we're to put off even certain things in how we speak. We're not to grieve the Holy Spirit by how we live our life, by how we talk, and the actions of how we live. We're not to grieve Him. To grieve, to grieve somebody is a product of love. You can only grieve somebody who loves you, right? As a mother grieving over the waywardness of a son, as a father grieving over a, a loved one that's gone astray, there's a, there's a grieving, and that's what we see that we are not to do to the Holy Spirit. We are not to grieve Him. And then he says, verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away with you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. As we continue in chapter 5, we see some more encouragements as to how we as God's people are to live. We see some prohibitions for some things that are not to be a part of our life at all. And here's what he tells us. Here's the plea that is given. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. He says, be imitators. Therefore, in light of everything that's been said, be imitators of God, to be followers of God. Literally, it means to mimic the Lord. He tells us that we are live, to live in such a way, that we live in such a godly way that it is imitating the Lord. That we are to live our lives in such a way that it is modeled. It is modeled after God. That is how we are to live. Therefore, be imitators of God. I remember when my kids were little, and Seth used to do this all the time, he would put my shoes on. You remember, anybody ever had their kids put their dress shoes on or their shoes on that are too big for them and they're walking around and they're imitating dad or they're imitating mom if it's a daughter. And you know, you and I, we are called as God's people to be imitators of God as dear children, that we are to pattern our life after Christ. Christ is the main example that we are to live our life after. Paul would say things, follow me as I follow Christ. He, he would even say in the book of Philippians, speaking of the spiritual leaders, you have us as an example, that you are, you are to be able to look at him or look at spiritual leaders and see examples of godliness, see examples, even to model your life after and we are called to be imitators of God as dear children. We're his, we are His children. We are adopted sons and daughters. We belong to Him. He is interested in us. We, we're His children. We belong to Him. He bought us with His own blood. He purchased us. I love what it said earlier in this book. We were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. 
He cares for us. The omniscient, eternal God looked down through the corridors of all of history and knew that you would be saved. And knew from eternity past. Isn't that an amazing thing to even comprehend? And He cares about us as dear children. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. He says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. As obedient children, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Right? We're to be as obedient children and we're to be holy. Why? Because our Father is holy. And we're to be imitators. We are to be imitators of God as dear children. Amen. I want to be holy. Why? Because He's holy. I want to be like Him. Amen. And then He says in verse 2, and He says, and here's that word that Paul uses, and walk in love. Walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. He says there, walk in love. Live a life that is characterized by love. Love is to be the entire spring from which everything flows out of the life of the Christian. Love. Love is to be the entire spring for, from which everything else flows in the life of the Christian. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. Let all that you do be done in love. The Holy Spirit, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the very first fruit that is mentioned, which is the foundation for all of the other fruit that are laid out to us. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's love. It is the spring from which everything flows out of in the life of the Christian. Paul, you remember in 1 Corinthians 12 when he was writing about the spiritual gifts, he says at the end of that chapter, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Love is the more excellent way. And that's when he goes on and he says, Yea, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. It doesn't mean anything. If you, you can have the gifts, but if you don't have love, you're just noise. You're not an actual benefit, and it doesn't even have a profit to you. Love. We are to walk in love. Jesus said, and I repeat this again and again, by this all will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. And we can do this. We can live this way because Romans 5 tells us that the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. The, the love of God has been poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit. It's been shed abroad in us. Oh, what love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Oh, what love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. We have experienced this love. This love has been poured out in our hearts. We've been given a new nature like unto Christ's nature. And the wellspring of our life now is to be love. We are to walk in love. And then he gives us the example as Christ 
has also loved us and given Himself for us. As Christ, Christ is the example, the epitome, love manifest. Christ, as He loved us. Think about that. How did Christ love us? It was an undeserved love. Christ loved us. It was an undeserved love. We didn't deserve it. It's an, it's an unconditional love. That is, His love is extended to us and it is not based upon anything that we do to qualify ourselves for that love. Because we can't do anything to qualify ourselves for that love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still unworthy, He died for us. While we were still ungodly, in due time, He died for us. We see here it's a sacrificial love. He offered Himself as an offering. It was sacrificial. He gave of Himself for us. A sweet-smelling aroma. An offering that was a sweet-smelling aroma. Paul uses this language that you read, in the, especially in the book of Leviticus and other portions where it talks about the offering and that being offered to the Lord and it ascended and it was a, a sweet smell to the Lord. It pleased the Lord. It was something that was well-pleasing to Him. As Christ offered Himself in love to save and redeem us, it was a sacrifice well-pleasing to the Lord. And our life is to be characterized by love, by loving each other in such a way that it is well-pleasing to the Lord. It, it rises up to the Lord and the Lord is pleased. That's to be the love that we are to have for one another, to characterize our life. We're to love each other. We're to love the unbeliever. We're to love the unlovable. We're to love people that are rejected and despised because that's the type of love that God has. That's the type of heart that the Lord has. We're to walk in love. I may understand tonight, God, God's love for you and I doesn't fluctuate. We're not going it, to... It's not like people. People in our life, it's, it seems... Doesn't it seem like their love does this? Like if you let them down or you do something that disappoints them, you know, you're going to know, you're going to know that something's not right there. And I am so thankful that God's love is not like that. I'm not, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and His love is going to be different because of anything in me or because of my own preconceived uh, thing, thoughts in my mind. It's not going to change how God feels about me. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. When we come to that understanding, when we realize that we are loved with perfect love, that we, God accepts us because of the, not because of us, but because of what His Son has done. We realize we are justified, forgiven, we're on our way to heaven. When we understand who we are in Him, that love, that perfect love, it casts aside all fear in us. Amen? Perfect love. Cast out all fear. And we are to walk in love as Christ has loved us. And now, now we go and we see in verse 3 and 4, He gives us some prohibitions. These are some things that you and I, we are not to live this way. Right? The, he shows us some ways that, that shouldn't, even be character, shouldn't even be named among us that are a part of that old self that's been cast off. That's, that's a part of walking as the rest of the Gentiles. It, it, now it's to be not even... It's, these are prohibitions. He says in verse 3, "...but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, 
as is fitting for the saints. Look at these prohibitions. He says fornication. It's that Greek word pornea, translated as sexual immorality. And refers to all types of sexual immorality that is outside the confines of the marriage covenant. Everything outside of the marriage covenant between one man and one woman is absolutely prohibited. It is not, that is fornication. It's sexual immorality. It's porneia, whether it's lust, whether it's sex outside of marriage, whether it's adultery, all of that is porneia. It is sexual immorality, and it's not to even be named among us. Right? We just realized, man, we're loved, right? God loves us. As Christ loved us, he offered himself up as a sacrifice. Now he says... But fornication and all uncleanness, uncleanness there speaks of impurity, anything filthy, anything defiling, any, any uncleanness or impurity. And then he says there, or covetousness. That of greed, unwanted desire, that sexual immorality, self-will, self-gratification. Paul says, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. That it's to have no place. That it shouldn't even come up. That's not saying sweep it under the rug if it's there. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that it shouldn't be there, right? It shouldn't be there, as is fitting for the saints. Don't you know who you are? You're a saint. You've been washed in his precious blood. You're his children now. And these type of things shouldn't even be named among you as his holy ones, as his saints. And then he says in verse 4, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. He tells us here filthiness, that's obscenity, or something obscene or degrading or disgraceful. Filthiness. Disgraceful talk or dirty speech. Foolish talking. Now this is interesting because that word there can also be translated as silly talking. Silly talking. And it comes from the word moros, from where we get our word, our English word, moron. It's speaking of pointless talking that leads to sin. That's what it's talking about. The, the type of foolish or silly talk that leads to worldliness or sin. We looked at a verse in the book of Proverbs where it says, Where the multitude of words is, sin is not lacking. Usually when there's just constant flow of talk. And I would say that for every child of God in this place tonight and everyone watching online, that these areas are probably the hardest areas, our speech. Right? And Jesus told us that for every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account for it on the day of judgment. James said that the tongue is an unruly member, and no one can tame it, but we by the Holy Spirit. We all, he also said in James chapter 1, if somebody doesn't bridle their tongue, their religion is in vain. It's useless if you, if you can't control it. But I would say to us, 
that every one of us, this area here, is where we probably go to God and ask for forgiveness more than probably any other area. And he tells us here, we are to not have foolish talk or silly talk, talk that leads to sin. And then he says, nor coarse jesting. Coarse jesting, that, that's speaking of sexual innuendo, turning something into something suggestive or obscene. Somebody turning something into being dirty. Coarse jesting. And then he says there, coarse jesting, which are not fitting. It's not fitting. It's not proper for a believer. Right? In, in light of all that we've experienced, it's, it's not fitting for us. It's out of place for us to talk like that. It's not fitting. It, it shouldn't... It just doesn't go together with a child of God. Right? That's what Paul's saying. It's not fitting. These things shouldn't characterize us. But then he says, but rather giving of thanks. That we are to speak in such a way that our speech is characterized by thanksgiving. Praise unto the Lord. He, he says a lot about this later on in chapter 5. He speaks about it in the book of Colossians as well, that how, how we are to speak to one another. But we are to give, but rather give thanks. Instead of talking filthy, instead of coarse jesting, instead of these type of things, filthy language, these type of things that come out, instead, it ought to be thanksgiving coming out of our mouth. It ought to be, we ought to be characterized by an attitude of thanksgiving unto the Lord. As Paul gave those instructions in 1 Thessalonians 5 where he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That we are to be continually thankful. We're to even to speak to one another. I love that in the book of Colossians. We're to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's, I mean, that's how we're to speak to one another. I would love it if we all, you know, if you got people within the church that you're close with and you text, if we sent text messages full of God's word. To, that's, that's a, man, that's an awesome thing to do. Brother Thompson would have to get text on his phone to do that. But that's an awesome thing to do. But that's not out of place. Right? It may seem weird, but we ought to walk up, we ought to be able to sing with each other. Amen? Wouldn't it be awesome if we ran into each other in Kroger and we started singing a hymn right in the middle of there? <laughs> you guys are like, you're nuts. I sing all the time when I'm in the grocery store and that's why my kids walk about 10 feet behind me. But we're to be characterized by giving of thanks. And then he says, he explains to us the, penal, the penalty. Now this is one of Paul's list. He's, you'll see these type of list that he gives in Romans, 1 Timothy 1, the book of Galatians. We're going to look at a few of those. But here he tells us the penalty. I don't want to say to you, I deal with this, this type of thinking all the time. And I feel like I'm always going back to it because it's so prevalent in certain theologies 
It's almost like you get something lodged in your mind and you're not going to be convinced otherwise, even though there's so many verses of Scripture that tell you that's not the case. And here's what he says. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Here you see the penalty. We saw the prohibitions, how we're not to live. But now he says, here's the penalty if you do live this way. And he says, this you know, that no fornicator that is sexually immoral, no unclean person, a covetous, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. They're not saved. They're not saved. That's what that means. And then he even says, don't let people deceive you with empty words. This is not the only time he says this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals or effeminates, which is an old English word for homosexual, nor sodomites, which is a male homosexual, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Let's read that again. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not Inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But look at verse 11. I love this. I love verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you, but you've been washed. He's able to cleanse us from all sin. Thank God. Thank God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. He saved you out of it. He redeemed you out of it. That doesn't characterize your life anymore. Your identity is not based on what you used to do. You're new. You're made brand new. Right? The idea of saying to God that I can receive all of the benefits of grace, but yet not live a changed life is a lie. That's what he's saying. Do not be deceived. Amen. Turn with me to Galatians 5.
Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's, we see, he says there in Ephesians, it's because of these things that God's wrath comes upon the sons of disobedience. He's already used that word in Ephesians chapter 2. He's already used that phrase, sons of disobedience. And here's what he said. He said, in you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. To be a son of disobedience is to be under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the sons of disobedience. That means when the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, it's speaking of the unregenerate. It's speaking of individuals who aren't born again, who are still under the dominion of the evil one. We all at one time conducted ourselves in this manner. He even tells us in Ephesians 2 that we all at one time, we all, verse 3, once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That, that's who we all were at one time. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. That he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But here you see the penalty for those who continue in that lifestyle. It's proof positive that they are not a Christian. This is not saying they can't be. They can't be forgiven and brought out of it. It's not, it's not even saying that you as a Christian don't stumble. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that a life that is characterized by that lifestyle is evident that you are not saved. Now here's the thing that I deal with on a literally all the time. Well, brother, they're saved, they're just not surrendered. Well, they're saved, they're just not living in obedience. And I want to say to you, show me a verse where that is at. Show me, take me to one text where it says you can live as a rebel against the word of God and Christ and still go to heaven. I'm not, show me, show me one verse. Show me. Come up to me. If you're watching online, send me an email or a text message. Show me one verse. We're saved by grace, but the grace that saves us is an empowering grace. It's not only grace that's unmerited favor that cleanses all of our past, but it's an empowering grace to live a holy life, not by your own effort. Man, you take the grace of God out of my life, I am vile. I am a wretch. And you are too. Right? We'd all be dogs returning back to the vomit. Every one of us. But true saving grace is an empowering grace. I'm not talking about perfection but the direction of your life 
has changed. You're going that way on that road. Yeah, you're going to stub your toe. You're going to trip up. You're going to encounter the enemy. Yeah, you're going to have setbacks, right? But you're still going that direction. Amen. Now, why is this so important? Because it keeps people from getting genuinely saved. It really does. If I tell somebody, oh, you prayed a prayer when you were 10, but you're living like the pure devil. Well, brother, you're saved. You just need to surrender your life. That's not, that is a lie. That's not true. My goodness. It's not true. If I said that, I would be a false teacher. But there are people that say that stuff. Amen? And here we see the penalty for those that live in that lifestyle. And then he says in verse 7, Therefore, Ephesians 5 and verse 7, Therefore do not be partakers with them. Don't be partakers with them. We're new creatures. We're His sons. We're His daughters. We've experienced the love of God that's been shed abroad in our heart. There's forgiveness there. There's cleansing there. When we fail, we go back to the fountain. We say, Lord, forgive me. Right? We, and He changes us. We're to walk this out. We're to live this out. Turn me to Titus 2. And we read this on Sunday morning in Sunday school, but... I just want us to see this again. And this is the last verse we're going to read and then we're going to have a time of prayer. In Titus chapter 2. It says in verse 11... For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's appeared to everybody. It's available to everybody. Anybody. Teaching us. Here's what grace teaches us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. In the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, from the penalty of the law. He purchased our new birth. Not only is the forgiveness of sin, but the new heart that is promised in the new covenant. He purchased it for us. He paid the price to take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. He paid the price to where the law of God would be written upon our mind and written upon our heart. He, he paid the price for that. To redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Purify us. Zealous for good works. Zealous to do good. And he says in verse 15, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And Paul in Ephesians, he's five. He's now telling us, remember the glorious realities of Ephesians 1. You remember that? Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Predestinated to adoption 
as sons, that we've been redeemed. In Him we have forgiveness of sins. In Him we have redemption and all these things. Now we've experienced that. Now what's He saying? Walk it out. Live it out. If you've experienced it, if you've encountered it now, live it out. Cast off the old man. All that stuff associated with the old nature. Cast it off. Put it off. Put filthy language out of your mouth. Right? Put the F-bombs out of your mouth. Put the stealing away. Stop doing it. Right? Stop it. You can. Before you couldn't. You couldn't do it. You were a slave to it. But now you can. You might still fail and slip up, but you can still, by that empowerment of grace, live a holy life. Now walk in love. Walk in love toward one another. He, that's what he's saying. Church, live it out. Live it out. Walk it out. Amen. Amen. Let's pray tonight. Lord, we love you and we thank you, God. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that makes us new. It changes us and transforms us. God, we look back over our life. We look back over the time that we've served you, Lord, and we see even today, where we're at today, God, is all by your grace. We know that. We have no grounds to boast holy living and the, the putting these things to death and all of that is because of your grace at work in our life. And so, God, I pray tonight as your people, as your children, beloved, as your dear children, God, help us to walk this out day by day, not in the strength of our flesh, because, God, there is no strength in our flesh to please you. God, not in the exertions of willpower, because even those come to an end, God. But Lord, help us to walk in the grace that you've enabled us. Help us to take hold of your word. Help us, God, to pray. Help us to congregate with the people of God. All of these things that you've given to us for us to be strengthened by and encouraged and built up and challenge, God, all of these things, God. We thank you for them. And Lord, I pray tonight, help us to walk. Help us to walk in love. To walk in love as you loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.